uh, is actually going to be a video recording um, because our speaker is uh, uh, in Japan. Um, so hang tight um, for Nat Sakamura's um, discussion on self-sovereign identity. Um, we're going to be starting that um, in just a couple of seconds whilst we queue up the video. Hi guys, I'm Nat Sakamura, the chairman of the Open Lady Foundation. It's really unfortunate that I can't be with you live today. It's because it's like 3 a.m. at where I am in Tokyo. But rest assured, I'm going to upload this video onto my YouTube channel so that you can actually ask questions if you wanted to. Now, today, you're going to learn three things. One, my take on what is self-sovereign identity. And the second one is how self-issued OP, we call it PSYOP, copes with it. And number three, the next step. So, without further ado, let's get into it. What is self-sovereign identity? I will start with the easy part. Identity. In a community, it's defined as set of claims related to entity. In general, there are many identities per entity. Here, you need to remember two things. First, there are many identities mapping to an entity in general. A lot of people mistakenly think that there is only one identity per entity. That is false. The second often found mistake is to conflate identity and identifier. Identifier is a label that uniquely identifies the entity in the set of entities. So please be careful not to conflate them. Now, the hard part, self-sovereign. Sovereign, according to Merriam-Webster, is defined like this. Among them, what we mean by, in this context, is definition 1b, one that exercises supreme authority within a limited sphere. This limited sphere is the self. In other words, with self-sovereign identity, you should be able to keep having you recognized by a service that is you who are coming back and also select what claims are to be provided to the service. Now, that's harder than you may think. We identity professionals tend to categorize digital identities in three buckets. One, my identity, which exists without being given by either party and that I have fundamental control on it. Two, our identity, which usually is given by somebody else but I can still use for my own purpose as well. An identity that is given by my employer or my Gmail address is a good example of it. In many cases, especially for consumer-facing identity, it's constructed as user-centric. You have the right to say how it should be used and so on. However, the fundamental right to the identity is on the organization and not on me. It may be taken away by the organization. Number three, the identity, which is the data about me, but I have no way to use it. My information in the company CRM system is an example. We cannot use their identity, so the choice is between my identity and our identity. But what if the identity you are using was our identity, the current mainstream identity? If they delete or ban your account, you will disappear from the internet and naturally your access to the service will be denied. To avoid that, I need to use my identity so that I can keep presenting me as me and the service can keep recognizing me as me as long as I want. It is an identity that will not be taken away, at least completely. It provides an ability for me to keep saying that it is me 
to the party I have a relationship with without respect to what other party says. Typically, it can be achieved by letting the service recognize me using the public key I generated to verify that I hold a private key. This forms the baseline of a self-sovereign identity. However, this is not enough. To build a relationship with another entity, you often need to disclose some claims about you. That leads to the second requirements to the self-sovereign identity. Selective disclosure of self and third-party attested claims about me. It is needed to express ourselves without respect to what others say. But we have to accept the fact that we don't control all the information about ourselves. For example, the permission to drive a certain type of vehicle is not determined by myself, but it is determined by the authority. You cannot change it, although you may have some control over where these claims are presented and processed as authentic. At the same time, we want to minimize the claims that are going to be disclosed depending on the context. So, a self-sovereign identity system must allow selective disclosure of self and third-party attested claims about me. That actually extends to the past and the future. From time to time, we may want to express what we were in the past. For example, Alice may want to prove that she had a computer science degree from a university back in 2001. Then, suppose that her university got out of business because of COVID-19 crisis. How can Alice prove her degree in 2032 then? Or suppose there was a regime change in her country and her nationality was renounced. Now she is stateless. How can she prove that she was a citizen of that country before the regime change? The third requirement for self-sovereign identity is that the system must allow the subject to prove that the claims were tested at a certain point in time in the past. So, to summarize, self-sovereign identity system must allow the subject to be independently recognized by the party she has relationship with, disclose self on third-party attested claims about her selectively, and prove that the claims were tested at a certain point in time in the past. Now I'm coming to the second topic, how PSYOP copes with it. PSYOP stands for Self-Issued OpenID Provider. OpenID Connect is defined in a specification called OpenID Connect Core 1.0 and related specifications. And SIOP or PSYOP is actually defined in Chapter 7 of this specification. If you don't know, OpenID standards are used everywhere. Sign in with Apple, Google's sign in, Microsoft sign in, GSMA Mobile Connect and so on are based on OpenID Connect and is estimated to be used by over 3 billion people. In addition, many countries and regions are using OpenID Connect in their citizen identity platform. Number of transactions are also large. As of last year, over 94% of Microsoft Azure sign-in are performed using OpenID Connect. OpenID FAPI, a new profile of it, is being used as the API access control standard by UK Open Banking and others that require higher level API protection. OpenID Connect, at its core, is Selective Claims Provision Protocol. When one of the claims are the proof of login, then the claim set can be used as federated login credential. But as you can see, it's not only the login information, it can carry arbitrary set of claims. 
That's why we call OpenID Connect an Internet Identity Layer. OpenID Connect provider can be provided by a third party or you can provide it yourself. It can be on the cloud or on your local machine like your phone. The letter has a special name, Self-Issued OpenID Provider or SIOP. There are capable actors that are involved in SIOP framework. Obviously, me, the subject, is at the center, and I'll be using Authenticator to authenticate myself to SIOP. It can be just your phone, right? And then there's an IDP or OP program, OpenID provider application, which is running on your local machine like your phone or PC or Mac. And then there are claims provider. Claims provider is a party which can attest the claims about you. And finally, there's a line party at which you actually subscribe to the services. So these are the main actors of SIOP framework. If you look closely, there are two legs in it. Leg one is between the Rhine party and SIOP here. And then leg two is between SIOP and claims provider. With this in mind, let's go into how things happens in SIOP framework. In the preparation phase, the first thing that happens is that SIOP gets registered to the dynamic or static claims provider. And then to bind your SIOP to the claims provider, you need to perform OpenID Connect authorization authentication. So the SIOP as a client sends OIDC authorization authentication request to the claims provider. And the claims provider asks you, do you like to authorize that access? And obviously, I would say, yeah, sure. But it will be granted. And as a result, access tokens and optionally refresh tokens are provided to my SIOP. That's the preparation phase. Now, in the usage phase, the client first asks the SIOP, who are you? And then I will issue a user info request with access token that I got in the previous phase to the claims provider. Then the claims provider returns user info as a JWT, job token. And that JWT will be included in the ID token that is going to be provided to the client. And when you look closely, there are a couple of problems that need to be solved. The issue number one is binding a sub in ID token in leg two to that of leg one, especially one in pairwise pseudonymous ID identifier, PPID or ephemeral identifier is being used against the client. The jolt, which is provided by claims provider, actually has to have the PPID as the UID in the token itself. Otherwise, the client cannot verify that the party, the entity that is identified in the ID token is the same person as that was described in the jolt within it. Second issue is the collection minimization. In the regular user info endpoint, there is no way to constrain the information that is going to be returned to the request. It will be okay to you know, filter them at SIOP if it wasn't assigned JWT. But in this case, because those values in JOT has to be verified by the client. The token is signed, and therefore 
we cannot do the filtering at this higher level. So the token actually has been minted specifically for this particular request. To achieve that, we actually have to send a list of claims to the claims provider, and then claims provider means the job that includes only what is being asked this time. Now, there is no specification that achieves this right now, and we are writing it as of today. So if you are interested in that kind of development, please come to the OpenID Connect working group and discuss. Now, once that's done, then the job, which is included in ID token, will only have what is being asked. So the collection minimization can be achieved. There are a bunch of to-do lists for PSYOPs. Here I have stated six of them. Registering the PSYOP to the claims pro provider so that PSYOP can request signed claims to the claims provider is kind of there, but it's not really well specified. And uh, most notably, there isn't any specification that talks about claims minimization or collection minimization. And uh, that needs to be done. And then binding the self-issued identifier, which is a hash of a public key, and the attested claim is, it's okay in the case of veronymous identifier, but when it comes to anonymous kind of identifier, it's actually not really well specified. And then we have no way of attesting the signing key from the past. And uh, in the case of PSYOP, we have no word at all about enabling of the key recovery. Also, we have nothing that specifies how to provide the claims to the running parties when the PSYOP is offline. There's another mode in Opera Connect, which is called distributed claims, in which case it can support the, the offline case, but that's not very well defined as well. And then finding that PSYOP address can become an issue. When we defined PSYOP, there was nothing like deep link. So we're using custom scheme. So for that, as long as there's only one app, which is using the custom scheme, which is OpenID colon slash slash, the finding or discovery of PSYOP address became non-issue. But with the reintroduction of deep links, it just came back. So these are the things which are not solved right now. We had SSI day uh, back in January 27th in Miyazaki. And it, like almost 30 people joined there, the, the workshop and hashed out what is the good pattern, what is not, what's, what is an anti-pattern, what could be requirements, so on and so forth. And taking those input, I've come up with uh, you know basic protocol requirements. There are separate operational requirements, but this is just protocol requirement, and I have just listed 10 of them, like self-issued keys and subject identifier with rollover and recovery, IDP discovery, proper specification, which has to happen always, and consent if necessary. You know, Consent is not always necessary. It can be uh, processed with other legal basis as well. Then uh, also I have to point out that uh, consent is not always possible. In our lifetime, the period that we can actually give the real consent is at a pretty limited. And then collection minimization claims, you know, CP claims provider, rank party and linkability, multiple trust claims providers, incentives for claims providers, choice of subject identifier, which can be short, short term, meaning it can even be ephemeral just one time or a short period of time or a long time, like lifetime. And then PPID, which stands for pairwise pseudonymous identifier or sector specific identifier or omnidirectional identifier. And it's up to your choice. And then counselor kind of uh, entity has to be there. It's sometimes called in the legal sphere, the libertarian paternalism. And also, we need to be able to leverage the existing infrastructures as much as possible so that the right party has minimal things.
to adopt these protocols. And uh, this is my evaluation of SIOP against this requirement. Some are fulfilled quite well, some are not. We have to bring the specification up so that it will be fulfilling all of them. So last week, we had the first ever SIOP virtual meetup. This is very well attended. The ticket just went like crazy. Within two hours or so, all the tickets were actually sold out. Over 100 people came along. That was actually almost everybody registered. And people from diverse background, like Decentralized Identity Foundation, Kantara Initiative, Microsoft, myself, with you know, various implementation came along and shared the problems. And in the end, we decided to you know, work together to solve these problems as quickly as we can. So we are going to convene the workshops and also start working on those items in OpenID Connect working group. I think we are going to form a sub working group besides it because it's a big group now. So if you're interested in finding out what's happening and if you're interested in providing some inputs into these works, please come along and join the Open Media Foundation working groups. It doesn't cost anything. What you have to do is just to agree that you don't sue the implementations. Here are some additional information that you could actually use. So I'm really looking forward to meet you in our working group or some other venue. And thank you very much for joining this session.